I am Dr. C. S. Singh in the Department of Mining Engineering, IIT, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. And I am looking after the rock mechanics and ground control division. This department, Department of Mining Engineering, IIT, BHU, was first degree awarding, postgraduate awarding, and doctorate awarding in the field of mining engineering. This department was recognized by University Grant Commission as a center of advanced study for rock mechanics and ground control. So when we talk about the rock mechanics and ground control, this department is having its own importance in the country. And uh, if we can say the rock mechanics study was first started by this department. Here, uh, rocks in the underground are in the open cast mining. The rocks are having three types of strength parameters. One is the compressive strength, second is the tensile strength, and third is the shear strength. First, we have to we are going to start with the compressive strength. So what is compressive strength? When this is the rock specimen, we are compressing so the maximum stress value at the time of its failure, that is the compressive strength. And the load, whatsoever load we are applying, this the load is being applied on this surface. So the, at the time of fracture, whatsoever the maximum load is it is bearing, that load is divided by this cross-sectional area that is the pi r square or in another word we can say pi d square by 4. So this will give the compressive strength value. But can we determine the compressive strength of a smaller one, of a bigger one? Will it give the same value? Certainly not. When the smaller one is there, the compressive strength value will be different. Bigger one, the compressive strength value will be different. There are different methods. When we want to uh, determine the compressive strength of a given rock specimen, so there are different methods. One is the direct method. We keep, place this specimen under the machine, we start loading and note down the maximum load at failure. We know the area, we directly calculate the compressive strength. But that machine is very heavy, we cannot take to the field. So there are some portable apparatus also for the determination of compressive strength, like proto Diakonov Strength Index, ISI Impact Strength Index, Smith hammer rebound number and point load strength index. These four different experiments, it gives the indirect, we can determine the compressive strength but in indirect method. So as far as my opinion is there, the direct method is the best one for the determination of compressive strength. So for the determination of the compressive strength, there are certain norms that has been standardized by International Society for Rock Mechanics. Why, why this need came for standardization? Because once we are determining in this India, someone is determining in outside uh, India in some other country. But the property, material properties should not vary. It should be almost same irrespective of the place and uh, uh, place where we are determining it. So for that accuracy, the ISRM has standardized. First of all, it standardized the length to diameter ratio. This 
length and diameter is here the ratio of l and d we can say length and diameter ratio it should be between 2.5 to 3 if we take a smaller specimen certainly the compressive will be strength will be different if we take bigger than this size the strength will be different so to make it to approach at an accurate value this has been standardized these two faces this one this face and this face it is known as the ends of the specimen ends of the specimen and these two ends should be parallel and if there is some undulation it should not be more than 0.02 millimeter so these are the very important points we have to take consider while determining the compressive strength similarly when we see the sides this is the sides of the specimen these sides should be free from any undulation there should not be any undulation there should not be any squeezing of the specimen why because the area on which we are applying the load it will not transmit properly up to the base of this specimen so to maintain that load we have to keep the sides smooth and parallel there should not be any undulation one should must keep in his mind that these specimens should be strictly prepared as per the ISRM standard another point suppose today we have taken out the core from a big boulder of rock we have kept it for a longer time again this if we are preserving it for a longer time the it will the strength parameter will get affected and this is not the case for compressive strength we will take uh, we will talk about the other strength also these specifications climatic condition should be followed for all the test so the temperature for storage should be around 20 degree centigrade plus minus 2 degree centigrade and the humidity where we are keeping this specimen should be 50 percent plus minus 5 percent so the temperature the size should be very very accurate then only we can get an accurate result and then only we will not our result will not vary from one place to the another place another parameter which is very important the rate of loading at what rate we have started the loading the specimen it should be 0.5 to 1 mega pascal per second so rate of loading should be 0.5 to 1 mega pascal per second so these things should be kept in mind during the preparation of the specimen before testing now we are coming to how to test it we have taken the core from a big piece of boulder we have to measure the diameter two places at the top one like this at another at right angle to this second at the middle of the specimen one in this direction another one at right angle and similarly two readings at the bottom of the specimen so how many readings we are getting we are getting six readings for the diameter of a specimen and we have to take an average of six readings 
and that diameter, the average diameter will be taken into account for the determination of compressive strength. Length also we measure, but in calculation there is no requirement of length, only we have to see that our, uh, our size of the specimen is as per the specification of ISRM or not. After measuring it, the diameter and length, we place under the machine between the platens, we start loading, we note down the maximum load which it bears, and at the time of failure. That, that load is divided by the area. What is the area? Area is cross sectional area in the cylindrical sample that is the pi r square or pi d square by 4. So, we can determine it in kg per centimeter square or we just transform, we change the unit, we get in mega Pascal that is the MPA. So, we report our result in terms of compressive strength in the unit of mega Pascal. So, this is about compressive strength. Thank you. So, compressive strength for the determination of compressive strength again we are going to discuss a new technique that is done by proto strength index. In this method we know the resistance of material against the load. So, first how to do proto strength index test? This test was devised by the proto SR senior, proto SR in and the name itself indi indicates the scientist is from Russia. So, for the determination of proto strength index, we take 50 gram of rock specimen. So, what should be the size of that specimen? Whether it should be a cylindrical, a square or whatsoever? No, it should not be a cylindrical, it should not be a square. The size of the specimen should be minus 1 inch to plus 3 by 4 inch. Minus 1 inch means the size less than 1 inch and plus 3 by 4 inch means the size of the specimen should be greater than 3 by 4 inch. So, there is proto of apparatus. We pour the 50 gram of the specimen in the cylinder. That cylinder is having a hammer. The weight of hammer is 2.4 kg. And the height, from what height we have to drop the hammer? It is 640 millimeter height of dropping the hammer 640 mm. One must remember it 640 mm. It should not be greater than this, should not be less than 640 mm. So, that apparatus is having a point and rod is there. We just take out the rod drop, the hammer falls freely. There should not be any extra exertion on that hammer. So, how many times you have to drop? Only 5 times. 5 times we have to drop the hammer on the specimen, then as a result what happens? Some specimen gets broken. So, after 5 times we take out the specimen from the cylinder, we pour it on a mess. The size of the mess is 0.02 inch or 0.5 mm. The mess size is 0.5 mm. Then we do the sieving. 
what happens after sieving we get some fine powder that is generated due to the load which we are dropping on the specimen and this fine is again poured in a volumometer there is another apparatus volumometer we pour that is powder in that we measure the height of the powder in the volumometer and that height should be taken in millimeter so point strength index is equal to 20 n divided by l so here we are getting two parameter two things n and l what is n n is number of strokes that is the number of strokes given by the hammer on the specimen that is 5 that is fixed and the length of the fine powder in volumeter that we have to take it in millimeter so 20 n divided by l what so value we are getting we are getting the toto diacono strength index so there is a relationship developed by the scientist and he uh, he derived that ucs that is the uniaxial compressive strength is equal to square root of 1.06 into e into pi again we are getting two things e and pi pi as we know this is the proto diacono strength index and e that is the young's modulus so for determination of compressive strength by indirect method one must know the young's modulus of that material and by this relationship we can determine the uniaxial compressive strength this apparatus is used for the determination of proto diacono strength index this is a hollow cylinder it is having 640 mm height of it and from this height we have to drop the weight this is the hammer 2.4 kg so when we have to drop first we have to take the specimen of minus 1 inch to plus 3 by 4 inch and we do the sieving by this sieves we are using this 1 inch sieve by 3 by 4 inch sieve and the material which is trapped on this are resting on plus 3 by 4 inch size 50 g from that specimen we take it and we pour it in this hollow cylinder after pouring the spare rock specimen then we just put this rod on this height rod here just we put this hammer over this rod and then we freely take this rod outside so that the hammer falls freely on the specimen so this is the falling of the hammer on the rock specimen and five times of the rock is a hammering is to be done on the rock specimen and after dropping for five times we take out this hammer first then at the base of this hollow cylinder we are having a cap over here we open this we have removed this cap now we will just stand this hollow cylinder the material rock specimen after hammering it will be collected on a piece of paper after collecting this we are using 0.5 mm 
sieve this is the mesh size of this sieve is 0.5 mm now we do the sieving by using this mesh the powder which we are getting here on this paper we put that powder in the volumeter and in that volumeter we record the height of the powder in volumeter and that height is to be taken in millimeter so final the formula for protodiacono strength index pi is equal to 20n by l n is number of strokes that is 5 which is fixed for this apparatus and for this test so 20 into 5 that is 100 this 100 is divided by the length of the powder which we observe from the volumeter in uh, millimeter suppose 15 millimeter is coming so 100 is divided by 15 we get uh, 6 point something so that is the index value of the rock specimen which we calculated by the using this protodiacono strength index apparatus when we got this pi value then again we are having the formula that ucs is equal to square root of 1.06 into e into pi e that is the young's modulus what rock specimen we have used we have to know the young's modulus of that specimen and multiplied by pi and then after doing the square rooting uh, we calculate the ucs value and this ucs value is from indirect method and that method is protodiagonal strength index apparatus which we have used So another method for determination of compressive strength that is the impact strength index. In short, we can we also call ISI. It is very similar to protodiacono, but there are some differences. And this test was devised by Evans and Pomeroy. Evans and Pomeroy in 1966 for conducting this experiment the weight of the specimen should be 100 gram so what should be the size of that the size of the specimen should be minus 3 by 8 inch to plus 1 by 8 inch so it means the specimen, specimen should be smaller than 3 by 8 inch but greater than 1 by 8 inch. Again there is a apparatus it is having a cylinder, hammer is there which is fixed in that, that hammer is to extend up to its maximum height and it has to be dropped freely. But the weight of that, the mass of hammer is less than protodiacono number of times for a stroke it is 20 in isi but if you remember in protodiacono it was only 5 so in this we have to give 20 impact the height of dropping the hammer is also less than the protodiacono so these are the basic difference between the protodiacono and impact strength index. Here after dropping 20 times of the hammer, we take out the specimen on a mess size of 1 by 8 inch. So naturally by dropping the weight some of the specimen will get break. So powder may be generated or the finer particles less than 1 by 8 inch that is generated and it is sieved out. So the material which is resting on the mesh of 1 by 8 inch that weight 
we have to measure that what is the weight of that material resting upon the sieve of 1 by 8 inch. So, the original weight of this specimen was 100 gram. Suppose we get the 80 gram which is resting after 20 times of a stroke in that on that mesh. So, we do 80 divided by 100 into 100. So, original weight that is W1 was 100. After hammering W2 that is the 80 gram and we represent this result in terms of percent. That is why we multiply it by 100. So, whatsoever the weight of the material on the mass of 1 by 8 inch that much is the percent. We represent it the ISI impact strength index of that particular rock specimen. Again the scientist Hobb, Hobb was a scientist who has given the relationship of ISI and the UCS, uniaxial compressive strength that UCS is equal to 769 into W2 minus 36360. So, I again I repeat that relationship UCS is equal to 769 that is a constant value multiplied by W2. Suppose we are getting 80 gram, so that 80 gram we have to multiply in 769 and minus 36360. Again these two constants was devised by that Hobbes, the scientist Hobbes after doing a number of times this practical. So, he developed this relationship and again we are getting the uniaxial compressive strength by indirect method. So, protodiacono and ISI these are very portable apparatus. We can take it to the field, we can go in the field and determine the compressive strength and we can have an idea of the compressive strength and we if we need we can apply that value for some immediate cause. So, but any testing for the same rock type we have to do 5 times whether by direct method whether by indirect method we have to perform 5 tests for a rock sample. There is difference between sample and a specimen. Sample we are bringing it from the field in the form of a big boulder and the specimen which we are preparing it for testing or performing the different tests as per our need. Thank you. This apparatus is known as impact strength index apparatus. This is also very similar to protodiacono strength index apparatus. It is also a cylindrical in shape. This is the upper part. Hammer is there in this hammer and this is the hollow cylinder. In this experiment we take 100 gram of a specimen of size less than minus 3 by 8 inch to plus 1 by 8 inch. Means the specimen should pass through this mess and should come on this mess. So, the material which is here on this mess 100 gram of the material is taken and poured into this cylinder. Then we put this hammer freely and then we fix this upper part of the cylinder, we tight it that 
the tightness should be complete because if there is some space tightness is not complete the powder which will be generated here it may come out from this. So, this hammer you have to extend the hammer up to this full length beyond this you cannot take it. So, up to this height you have to raise the hammer and drop the hammer freely. So, this dropping of the hammer is for 20 times, dropping of the hammer is for 20 times, then after completing 20 times we open this cylinder again we take it out hammer and the rock specimen is which is in this cylinder we pour it on 1 by 8 inch mess. So, we just pour this a rock specimen on this mess then we do the sieving of it and the material which is resting on this mess size is again weighed we take the weight of the specimen which is resting on it. So, hundred fin uh, finally, if it arrives suppose 80 gram or 75 gram or 85 gram whatsoever it is coming we measure it and then again for the determination of UCS there is a relationship UCS is equal to 769 into W2. W2 is the mass of material after dropping the hammer for 20 times which is resting on this mess is multiplied mine and a value 36360 is subtracted from that value and ultimately we arrive to the value of UCS uniaxial compressive strength. So, another indirect method for determination of uniaxial compressive strength that is the point load strength index. So, point load as the name itself indicates whatsoever we are applying the load that is in the form of a point, but the point is blunt not very sharp. It is the end of that platen is the blunt one. Why it is blunt? Why not very sharp? If very sharp it is start giving some pinning to the specimen and it may break. So, the uniform the uniformity of the loading of this specimen that end of the platen is kept blunt. So, for the determination of point strength index point load strength index there are three methods. One is for axial test another that is the diametral, diametral means the specimen may be loaded through the diameter of the specimen axial along one axis in the line we are loading. Suppose we are not having any axial of diametral specimen for the determination of point load strength index we can determine it from some irregular lumps also. You can just pick one lump from the field just get it timbered measured its maximum and minimum thickness of the specimen and we can load it in that apparatus we can find out the load at failure maximum load at failure and there is some relationship by that relationship we can determine the point load strength index of irregular lump or we can say even for the block of this rock specimen. So, for axial one again there is a LD ratio that should be 1.1, 1, 1 is to 1.1. So, diameter and length ratio should be 1 to 1.1 and while loading we have to take we have to take care that loading is starting from the center of the specimen 
Suppose this is not for that test, but I am just giving an example. Here it is having the center. For axial, we have to load in the center of it. Why center? If we are loading it towards the edges, it will not give the accurate value. The accuracy level, level will be very low. So, for that we have to fix this specimen under the platen in the center of the core on both the sides and we determine the length of the specimen at which it fails. Naturally, this is the L1, suppose this is the L1 of the specimen original length. It only keeping this platen on this ends, it will not fail. It will fail when it is starts getting some load. So, that load is div uh, given by that platen and some depression will be there because when we are applying the load, some depression on both the ends will be there. And we have to measure the distance between the two platens at the time of failure. So, that is given by P divided by D E square. P that is the maximum load at failure, D the distance between the two platens. So, for axial the size specimen is different. Now, for diametral test we are loading through the diameter of this specimen and the LD ratio should be 1.4. The LD ratio should be 1.4 and again we have to take care that 0.7 should be the on this side, 0.7 should be on this side and we are loading from this middle point. Why? Suppose if you are loading it here, what will happen? The weight will also play the role in breaking. So, this is not the accurate, accurate. For the accuracy level, we have to place, apply the load on the center of it, start loading. Again, some depression will be there. We have to measure the distance between the two platens and same formula P by D E square. And for the block or the irregular lump, we have to take it, timer it, measure and that will be used in that formula for the irregular lump or the block size of the specimen. And by putting that values in the formula, we determine the point load strength index. Again, you have to take care this is index, not the uniaxial compressive strength. So, a uh, scientist has given the relation that UCS is equal to 12 to 24, 12 to 24 into point load strength index PI. This 12 to 24, this is the constant value, it varies depending upon the type and nature of rock. So, we have to develop a relationship between the direct uh, compressive strength by this point load strength index. We have to develop the constant value for the same rock type, uh, then we will multiply by that constant value to point load strength index, it will give the UCS, uniaxial compressive strength. So, this is also a indirect method, but the care must be taken that minimum 5 specimen should be tested for one rock sample. Thank you. Another method for determination of uniaxial compressive strength by indirect method that is the Smith rebound hammer method. This is the Smith hammer. You can see this is the pointed edge. This is the complete setup of Smith hammer. 
it is having a spring and a steel ball in it when we are pressing this point on the rock wall or on the rock floor or on the rock uh, rock roof when we are going to pressing 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 there is a storage of energy at a limit that storage of energy is released by rebounding that steel ball which is fixed there in the spring so the time when there is a rebound of that ball one sound is generated and at the same time it is having a button we have to press it we have to press this button what happens after pressing this there is a scale of here it is a scale of rebound number some point will be there and we will note down that rebound number so we note this number that is that will be our first reading we can use it in vertically upward direction vertically downward direction or in horizontal direction but if we need it to use it in an inclined way so that also we can use we uh, in that manner and there is a correction factor that uh, their formula is given for the correction factor and then we have to recalculate the rebound number which is noted from this scale so after the correction using the correction factor we will take that rebound number as our first reading as you see this instrument is very handy very portable we can carry it in our by in our hand we can go to the field we can determine the compressive strength of that location or of our area of interest we can determine and we can immediately apply or uh, if there is some problem we can try to resolve that problem by using this hammer and getting the compressive strength value so minimum 20 readings we have to take it in one direction when when we are using it in horizontal direction on the same rock wall rock wall means the wall is there or in the underground mining gallery is there gallery is having the wall that is known as a rock wall and on that rock wall we are using this hammer we are just finding out 20 readings in that 20 readings we will observe that some readings are of higher value some readings may be of less value so the less value we have to discard and we have to take 10 readings of higher values from the 20 readings and then we have to take an average of 10 values so that will give the average rebound number which we can determine from this scale the manufacturer has already provided a correlation between the rebound number and the compressive strength and that graph is here i can show you this is the graph in respect to the direction of using this hammer one is vertically downward then middle one that is the horizontal and the bottom most that is vertically upward direction so on the x axis the rebound number is given here on the x axis we are getting this here rebound number on the y axis we are getting the corresponding compressive strength value on that depending on the direction of using the hammer and the rebound number we will take that reading from this y axis this y axis is in 
newton per millimeter square the unit of this is newton per millimeter square and as we know 1 newton per millimeter square is equal to 1 ampere so suppose when we are getting 40 newton meter per millimeter square that is equal to 40 mega pascal the compressive strength of that rock specimen so the care must be taken as the ball the steel ball rebounding immediately we have to press this button of the hammer if we fail it we are not pressing it on time we could not get the reading on this scale it will show zero reading so that is the main precaution while using this smith hammer and by this way we are getting the uniaxial compressive strength by indirect method but it is very handy very portable and you can take it in the field by any means without its weight is uh, about 1 to 1.5 kg only so it's very handy that's all thank you today we are going to discuss the tensile strength of a rock specimen how to determine the tensile strength what should be the specimen size and so on we will see it now important strength parameter is the tensile strength of rock generally we find that rocks are failing more in tension as compared with compression so tensile strength is having the paramount importance from rock mechanics point of view there are two methods for the determination of tensile strength one is direct method another one is the indirect method the direct method has not become so popular because it is having some limitations some problem problem in the sense it is the mounting of a specimen in that scale so the fixing of the specimen in that apparatus that is giving a great problem because we have to use a proper and good adhesive so that the steel frame is fixed with the specimen and sometime when we start pulling in direct test so what happens the adhesion where we have used that frame is dislocated so to ease to overcome that problem a scientist brazilian has developed an indirect method and for indirect method he has developed a brazilian case here you can see this is the brazilian case it is having two jaw this is the lower jaw this is the upper jaw we have to just put pin is there we have to fix it again the specimen size is 54 mm 54 mm diameter of this specimen and the thickness it should be around 27 mm means half of the diameter but in this there is some limitation also that we have to use 54 mm diameter specimen for determining the tensile strength tensile strength is very important parameter for the design engineer when some mining engineer civil engineer or design engineer is designing some uh, structure for the, its stability point of view that tensile strength is to be taken proper care of if we are not paying the proper care on tensile strength the structure may get fail so our planning our designing may get fail for that to overcome that issue we have to determine the tensile strength in a right man right manner 
and for that we are using this Brazilian case. These two jobs as we have already seen, this is the rock specimen. So, we have to fix this rock specimen in this cage. Okay. So, after that we have to put this cover which is having a flat surface on it. You can see this is the flat one. Why we have to provide give the load on a line not on the whole surface. We are loading it on a line and then the fail will take place, the failure will be there. So, on this plate we are applying the load with the help of universal testing machine UTM or servo controlled stiff testing machine MTS or any other loading machine available in the laboratory. So, we are loading it on it, load is given along a line and fail will take place and that failure here it should be vertical. The failure should be vertical in the center of the specimen. If the failure plane is not vertical it means there is some mistake in doing the experiment. Another thing also while designing the Brazilian case it is having some space on both the sides and it is having an angle of 10 degree. This space is given for the failure and that is of 10 degree. So, it will fail in a vertical way. If it is some inclination is there or something wrong is there, you have to discard that result. Again you have to test it under this using this Brazilian cage and minimum 5 specimens must be tested for arriving a value of tensile strength. And that is it is having a formula tensile strength is, is equal to P divided by pi r t or 2 p 2 p divided by pi d t. So, r you know the radius of this specimen when we are using p by pi r t, r is the radius, t is the thickness or when we are using 2 p by pi d t. So, d is the diameter, t is so diameter this one when we are having this specimen diameter is this one and thickness is this one. So, this is t and this is d and p that is the maximum load at failure. So, by this formula we get the tensile strength of a given rock specimen. Thank you. This lab comes under the rock mechanics and ground control division. Here we are having the different machines. See this one is the universal testing machine UTM. It is having a loading capacity of 40 ton. So, and these are the two loading frames here. This is the platform where we keep the specimen with the cage and after mounting the specimen in the cage, we are putting the specimen over here and load is being applied from this control panel. So, we will see how to do that test and we start with the tensile strength. In this tensile strength where we are use determining the tensile strength by the indirect method that using the Brazilian cage as we know these is two parts lower jaw upper jaw. In between the lower and upper jaw we have to fix the specimen. like this. 
after fixing this specimen the top of it we are using this this is almost semi circular in shape so that the loading is being done along a line so we put over here here a depression in this depression this semi circular part will be fixed over here and we keep it on this frame now this machine is having four button here on the top of this red button here it is the start button when we have to start the machine we have to press this button and at the end when we are completing our experiment we have to press this red button to switch off the machine now it is see another two buttons here one is in upward direction another one is in the lower two arrows are there one for upper another for downward direction so when we have to bring this platform either we have to move in upward direction or to bring it in downward direction we use these two buttons for bringing the platform loading platform and mounting the rock specimen and then when fixing of the specimen is over in the case under this loading frame then we provide the load by using this handle and this is monitored manually in such a way that the rate of loading should be in between 0.5 to 1 mega pascal per second so this is the frame by which we are giving the load to the specimen how we will uh, recording here it is a uh, meter in which this needle will move and it will, will indicate how much load we, we have, have to, to arrive we have arrived the level of the loading means it is in tons the unit of this is in tons if you see here it is showing 0.4 ton 0.8, 1.2, 1.6, 2 ton. Likewise. So it is having three scales. This machine is having three scales from 0 to 4 ton, from 0 to 20 ton, and from 0 to 40 ton. The maximum loading capacity by using this universal testing machine that is the 40 tons. So depending upon the type and nature of rock, we use the scale whether we have to perform under 0 to 4 scale ton scale 0 to 20 ton scale or 0 to 40 ton scale so we know almost that how much load it may bear so depending upon that we fix the scale for more accuracy means if we are using the smaller scale 0 to 4 it is having the bigger division the accuracy level will be more because it is when soft material or it will take less loads the scaling is good and we can arrive to a accurate more close values the specimen on which the rock is getting fed so now we are going to start this machine for testing a rock specimen for determination of tensile strength. See, we have tested this specimen for tensile strength under this UTM and this crack means failing of this rock specimen is almost vertical. If it is not vertical, we may discard that test because we are applying the load along a line so that the load is propagating through the center and the crack must come in the center and almost vertical. So 
we have performed this test very well. The crack is almost vertical. Now we will take out this specimen from this Brazilian case and we will see that the there is some powder generation due to crushing of grains are present or not. A specimen has been taken out from this Brazilian case and this crack is almost vertical. Just you see this is in two parts and if you see it minutely there is no powder generation means there is no crushing of grains and the failure is in tensile failure. And if you move your finger on this, you will get the rough surface on both the fractured surface. There is no smoothness, no powder generation, the rough surface is there. And if you see, there is no powder, no crushing of grains. And this failure is purely due to the tension and this failure is tensile failure. Thanks. Myself, Dr. C. S. Singh from Department of Mining Engineering, IIT, BHU. Today, we are going to discuss the shear strength of a rock specimen. How to determine what should be size specifications and how to perform this test, today we will see. And what is the relationship, how we will determine the shear strength. First of all, we see that there are number of methods for determining the shear strength and broadly we classify into two groups. One is unconfined method and another is the confined method. What is the difference between unconfined and confined? Unconfined means we are not giving support from other side, we are loading from one direction. Confined, there are two things, one is biaxial, another is triaxial. Biaxial means we are, we have confined the specimens from the two directions and in triaxial, we are giving the load from all the three directions. This test, the case is here, this is for unconfined method for the determination of shear strength. And this case is used for the determination of double shear strength. Double shear or we can also call this, uh, call this case as a double shear cage. It is having three parts, one is the upper one, this one base one is this one and at the base this frame is there for fixing the specimen and this specimen is here. We have to fix it by using this frame at the base. At last we will take this frame out and start loading the specimen and we will see here how to fix the specimen in this case. So this is the base one. And you see here there are two walls. Means double shear, why we are calling it double shear? Because this specimen is being loaded along the two planes. So this specimen it will break it will break into three pieces because one plane is here, another plane is here, so it will break along two planes. So this is double shear method. Just we will see how to fix it. This is the lower one, this is the upper loading frame. We have to place in this and just we will rise it and fix this frame to make it free.
just reinsert this is specimen in this is hole the care that the length of the specimen should not be more than 75 mm for this particular case because once the length is more it will come out from the case which will give problem and accuracy level will be low so here you see this is the frame we will take out this base plate from here see i have taken this base plate out to give the space here so that when we are applying the load on it it will break due to this space so we start we will start after mounting we will start this start loading it on this by using the utm universal testing machine or servo controlled stiff testing machine that is the amts or any other loading machine which is available in laboratory so load will be applied over here it will break and we will note down the maximum load at failure so for this method the formula is p by 2a shear strength is equal to p by 2a p is the maximum load at failure and a is again we are using the cross sectional area because the breaking is along the cross sectional area that is the pi r square so p by 2 into pi r square that will give the shear strength there are number of method but shear strength tensile strength compressive strength all the strength parameters are the material property in whatsoever we are by method we are determining it the result of it may be almost same or if some variation is there that is in the tolerable limit and how to recognize that our material is failing due to tension or due to shear in tension failure when material is failing in tensile mode it will give no powder generation on the breaking phase you will not find the powder generated on that phase but in shear strength the breaking start from the crushing of the grains powder some powder will be generated when you move your finger on that plane some it the finger will get soiled or the powder will be there on your finger so this is the method or you can use for knowing that in what mode the raw is getting fail whether it is tensile or shear so now we are uh, for determination of shear strength by double shear method we are using this case and this is the lower one this is the upper frame and in between these two we are having a hole here in this hole this specimen will be fixed so now we are fixing the specimen this is the base plate we will remove before the loading of the specimen here base plate is capped see this is the base plate we have fixed over here now this upper one will be kept so that all the three holes are in a line and we fix this specimen in this hole and the length of the specimen 
should not be more than the length of this pole or cage. Now the uh, specimen is fixed in this case. We will put this case under under the loading frame and after keeping it on the loading frame, we will remove this base plate. So now we are going to keep it under the machine, then we will take out this plate to give the space so that load is applied from the top and it will go down and the specimen will fail. So we observed a sound and that sound gave us a signal that the material has failed, means it has broken. Then to take out this specimen from this cage, again we are fixing this base plate under this so that we can take the specimen out. The specimen failed and we found some powder which is generated in this cage here you see this is the powder and here already given this powder is there and this specimen has broken into three parts because we are loading the specimen on the two planes along two cross sectional direction. So, here we find the powder. This powder is due to the crushing of grains of the specimen and by seeing this powder, we can say that this material has failed under the sear. So, sear failure is there and this is the major difference between the tensile failure and the shear failure. So, when we observe this face, it is having powder and this is the main difference between the tensile failure and the shear failure. In tensile failure, no powder generation means no crushing of grains and in shear, the failure starts from the crushing of the grains and then it breaks. So, this is the main difference. In tensile, no powder, no crushing, in sear there will be crushing of grains as a result we find the powder. Okay.